Hello, church, and welcome to another week of online services. And, you know, just reminded every week that we know that this whole situation isn't ideal, but we still hope and pray that through these recordings, the streams, and all of that, that you can find a way to, to dig into your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and, and find some hope and find some encouragement somehow. And, and for all of you who are gathering in homes this weekend or watching this individually, just thank you for taking the time to do that. And thank you for taking the time to gather together if you are. It's so important during this time when we're not doing the, the large group setting. I uh, just want to remind you, we've said it before in some other videos, but uh, we're going to be doing this. We've decided as a church leadership to stay in this mode of online through the end of the year just because of some of the uncertainties and back and forth and you know, we, we went back and forth on that decision too. So, but that's the conclusion we came to. We have a lot of great optimism, even in the new framework and even with the potential of the county going up in risk category, that we will be able to go back to what we were doing earlier in November and the early part of the fall and late summer with in-person gatherings come the weekend of January 9th and 10th. So we're still planning and heading in that direction. It will be here before you know it. I mean, Christmas is only a couple of weeks away itself. So just please continue to pray for uh, our community, for our church, for the church leadership. We really, really appreciate that very much. So thank you. Um, again, we're going through Core 52 right now, and we're in Chapter 46 in, in the book. And that topic for this week is unity. And the core verse comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. It says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So that's Ephesians 4, 4 through 7. Again, uh, that's the core verse for this week on chapter 46, the topic being unity. And I really want to encourage you to read through the chapter like always. We always encourage you to do that to keep up. But this one's really good. Mark goes in a little bit of a direction that we're going to go differently here this morning or this evening or whenever it is you're watching in our text. And he talks about spiritual gifts and how God's given us each a, a gift of some kind. And the purpose of that gift is to build up the body of Christ and therefore uh, bring unity to the body of Christ in that way. We're going to go to a little bit more of a basic route this morning. And we're actually going to be in Acts chapter 15. That's the story text. That's the day three assigned reading. And in Acts chapter 15, we have a very pivotal event in church history and in the book of Acts. And it's really a pivot point in the story of Acts going from Judea, Jerusalem, then focusing more on ministry of Paul and to the Gentiles. And it, it really speaks of this critically important decision that the early church had to make that seems a little foreign to you or I on, on surface level as we, as we read through it. But it was important to them for the sake of the church and the unity of the church of determining what is this base rallying cry that we can gather um, under? What's that banner that we can gather under together regardless of what we look like, what our past is like, where we come from, what our cultural differences are. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, kind of that, that banner that we can all rally together under and be unified together as the family of God. So let me go ahead and say a word of prayer, and then we'll dig into our text today. Father, I just thank you so much that your grace is available, and your grace is more than sufficient, and your grace abounds, Lord. And you know that uh, we need your grace so much. And it feels like, especially this year, as so many of us are are scared and are anxious, are worried, are frustrated, are angry, uh, whatever it may be. We need more grace, Lord, to get through each day. And Lord, we need more grace to be gracious with one another. So we just ask for more and more of your grace. And I thank you that we have even stories like this in, in Acts chapter 15 that are demonstration that your grace is the center point. Your grace is the banner in which we rally and are, are unified together as your family regardless of our differences. So, Father, I just pray that as we look at this scripture, that that would be our banner that we gather under, our rallying cry together, that the grace of Jesus 
is what brings us together. And, it, and the grace of Jesus is for anyone, anyone who would believe. So, Father, thank you for our time together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, just to kind of give you a little bit of a background to chapter 15 before we get there, we kind of have to look back at chapter 10, and I'll just abbreviate this stuff for you. But in chapter 10, you have Peter, the Apostle Peter. If you're familiar with church at all, if you've ever been to church or heard anything church stuff, or maybe you're from a Catholic background, you've heard of the Apostle Peter or St. Peter and Peter is one of my favorite characters in all of Scripture. He really kind of inserts his foot in his mouth all the time. He's famous for denying Jesus at that bonfire as Jesus was on trial, yet at the same time being restored to, to ministry and reconciled to Jesus in John chapter 21. He's the one who, uh, in Acts chapter 2, as the Holy Spirit comes down for the first time and believers in Jesus Christ for the first time receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who stands up in front of everybody and preaches a gospel message. And, and when the crowd asks, what must we do to be saved? It's Peter who addresses them. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Father for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And and that's what happens, and he's really at the forefront of, especially the front half of the book of Acts, and leading the church, and its ministry, and its boldness to proclaim the gospel, and healing people, and, and all these sorts of things. But you get to Acts chapter 10, and this is our first moment where we see the gospel kind of starting to spread out from Jerusalem and the Jewish people. Um, Jesus was a Jew. He lived his life around Jews. He would interact with Samaritans and the like now and then. He interacted with Pilate, of course. But he spent his time with 12 uh, uh, disciples and, and some more that were Jews. And when he left them in Acts chapter 1, he said, You will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That this gospel message, the message of the grace of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection is not just for the Jew. It's not just for those living in Jerusalem and Judea, but it's also for the Samaritans. And right off the bat there, for the Jewish background, the Jewish upbringing that the apostles, even just the 12 would hear, those dirty dog Samaritans, are you kidding me? We're going to take it to them. But now you're also including the Gentiles? Like, we're a special people. What do you mean this message is going to be to all people? Well, anyways, we get into uh, Acts chapter 10, and Peter has this vision of unclean food basically being rolled out on a picnic blanket for Peter to eat. And, and Peter's hesitant in this dream, and God says to him, hey, what God's made is not unclean. This is totally the abridged version, right? So go ahead and eat. Eat that goat meat that you didn't want to eat before, you know, those sorts of things. And, and uh, eat the bacon, you know, that was unclean, but now you can have bacon. And hallelujah for that part of Scripture, right? And so anyways... It all leads to this interaction that Peter has with Cornelius, who is a Gentile. And remember, uh, when we talk about the term Gentile, we're talking non-Jew. So you and I, we would be included in this, this conversation as Gentiles. That, that this conversation that they're having in our text today uh, opened the door for you and I to come and know the grace of Jesus without extra requirements to do so. But anyways, it's a, it was a, an incredible moment in the history of the church when Peter then goes to the house of a Gentile named Cornelius and he shares the scripture with them. And then the whole household is baptized and he has to share that, that story with the brothers who are Jews of the church and say, hey, this whole group of Gentiles over here was converted. So we go a little bit further down in the story. We have this guy named Saul, right? He's a Pharisee, and Pharisees were like these religious leaders. They were very self-righteous. They were very legalistic. In other words, they were so particular about following the rules of the Old Testament law because they sincerely believed that if they could follow the rules really well, that they would earn their spot in God's salvation, that God would owe them an opportunity into his kingdom in, in his presence for all eternity. And so they were very legalistic. It came a lot to do with what they could do to earn their salvation and earn their righteousness. That was never the intention, right? So anyway, Saul is going around. He's a Pharisee and he's persecuting the church. His, his, his goal is to destroy the church. And he has a conversion experience. He becomes one of the, the main characters in the whole story. He's the one who's responsible for writing the majority of the New Testament. 
You know, some of the most important theological scripture we have that teaches us deep meaning and very important stuff about faith and salvation and grace and repentance and baptism and, and all these sorts of things. Paul penned those words. And, and so he converts, Jesus shows up, he becomes a believer, he becomes a follower of the way, he becomes a disciple of Jesus, and eventually he gets sent out on a mission. God calls him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And so how incredible is this, right? You've got this Pharisee who's very much entrenched in the Jewish way is the right way. You have to be a Jew in order to be God's people. And that means there's all these rules in the law that you have to follow in order to be a Jew, in order to be God's people. And so it's really pretty fascinating then that Paul, Saul, who would later become known as Paul, would be the apostle to the Gentiles. And you get into chapter 13 and you get into chapter 14 and Paul is on his missionary journey. He's got a guy named Barnabas with him. In fact, in chapter 13, he's still referred to as Saul. And as you start making your way through chapter 13, then all of a sudden we start calling him Paul, <laughs> sort of a thing. And he's preaching to all these different places and all these people and he's, he's having this interaction with Gentiles and they are converting to faith in Jesus. They hear the gospel. They believe the gospel. They repent. And, and again, if you're not familiar, repent simply means to turn away from your old sinful life and turn toward God. That's what we mean when we talk about repentance. So they've heard the gospel. They've believed the gospel. They've repented of their sins. They've confessed that they believe and that Jesus is Lord. And they've been baptized. And those things, like the New Testament usually brings those five pieces together, where a scripture might talk about one or two, when you take the collective picture, that's usually the culminating experience of somebody converting or uh, becoming a, a Christian are those events transpiring over a period of time together. Anyways, Paul sees Gentiles become believers in Jesus and called into the family of God by the grace of Christ. And as he's sharing these things in chapter 14, then you have like Jews starting to make issue with this and basically saying, no, these Gentiles need to be circumcised in order to become Christians. In order to be a part of the family of God, they have to be circumcised. And that seems like for you and I today, this seems like the weirdest thing ever. Like, why are we talking about circumcision? Why does circumcision come up so much in the New Testament? Why does Paul always talk about circumcision? He talks about it in Colossians chapter 2, right? You're no longer circumcised in the flesh with hands, with human hands, but now through your baptism, through the faith and the working of God, you were raised from the dead and, and you were circumcised by the Spirit in the heart. And so we, we talk about circumcision all the time. It goes all the way back to Abraham. And God calls Abraham to come and be his, his man to follow after him. And he would bring him to a promised land. He'd bless him and he would multiply him and make him a nation for, for God's chosen purposes. And so he established a covenant relationship with him. And that sign of that covenant agreement was circumcision, physical circumcision of, of the men. And that was a sign that became the Jews in the world. That's what they did. And so... As weird as that might sound, that's just kind of what the history is behind that. So the Jews would say, no, in order to be God's people, this family of, of Abraham's offspring, even with the belief in Jesus and His grace, you need to be circumcised to be a part of the family. And so the question then started coming up like, well, they're not Jews. Why would we make them do that? And that's really the background then of Acts chapter 15. I know it's been a long buildup and a long story to it, but it's very important for why would they need to have a whole board meeting, <laughs> a council, so to speak, to have this discussion? Because the basic question is, well, who gets to be saved? How do different people from different cultures, if we're preaching to the Jews and we're preaching to the Gentiles, how do they become one unified family of God? And there are a group of people that were contending and demanding that in order to be a part of the family of God, circumcision must take place. It's not just the grace of God, it's circumcision. So that's where the problems came up. So we get into Acts chapter 15, and it says this, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
Whoa, right? So this again, this is the introduction to our issue here in this chapter, that this is an addition to the gospel message. The gospel message has terms to the covenant. There are still terms to entering into a saving relationship with, with God. And he's laid those out throughout different parts of the New Testament, even through the book of Acts. And like I enumerated before, it's usually, it's not one of these things apart from the other, but usually when somebody comes to a saving faith in Jesus, the normal operation of that happening is hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, turning away from your sin or repentance, confession and baptism. And I know a lot of people get hung up on the baptism part, and I don't really want to have a big, long discussion about that because it's not the topic in this. But we just need to remember that it is an act of faith in the working of God, as Paul would say in Colossians chapter 2, that Christ Jesus was raised from the grave. So if you don't believe that through the act of baptism, that you are uniting with Christ through the powerful working of God, you were dying to your sinful ways and raising as a new creation, then yeah, baptism is simply a work of the flesh. But baptism is a wonderful blessing and a gift of grace from God to be received with faith in this process, okay? So that's, that's why we talk about it a lot and why we put some emphasis on it, because it's a gift of grace from God in the powerful working of Christ Jesus through His death, burial, and resurrection. And it requires faith. It requires faith. So anyways, they want to add on top of that. And it seems like silly to say that, but uh, we might not talk about circumcision nowadays as being an extra requirement to become a part of the family of God. But I bet you, some of you out there, even if you've been in church your whole life or maybe you've never really been a part of a church, you can think of different things, different churches that you've had experience with have added as their new circumcision. That you have to do this or act this way or think this way in order to be a part of the family of God. Or if these people think slightly differently about this topic, then, then we're not going to have any association with them. And this is a really tough thing because you look around the world today and you see all these varieties of churches and we're like Baskin Robbins. There's more than 31 flavors though and it's like take your pick. And it doesn't seem like the church is very unified and to be quite honest, in many occasions it's not and it's sad. It doesn't take away the message that's been preached in Scripture that even if we might agree or disagree on styles of music and that establishes a different congregation over there than this one based on music preferences or how often we take communion, what elements do we use in communion, can you speak in tongues, is tongues not a thing we do, all these sorts of things have kind of separated us a little bit. I, I still believe that, and I am getting a little off track here, I know, but I still believe that even with those slight differences, we can operate together as a family of God unified under the banner of the grace of Jesus Christ. But all that to say, let's get back on track here. They were adding circumcision as a requirement to be a part of God's family. Verse 2, And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, <laughs> I love that, no small dissension and debate, Y'all have been a part of some debates, I'm sure, that were not just small in dissension or emotion. <laughs> Because you believed passionately about them, right? Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. And I love that Luke includes that here in this passage. Because he goes and he's like, okay, so these people brought up this issue and said, you can't be saved without circumcision. So Paul and Barnabas are like, you know what? We're going to take this to the top of the pecking order. We're going to go down to Jerusalem. We're going to have a conversation with Peter and James. Now, Peter and James are basically the leaders of the church. Of course, Peter was with Jesus. We just talked about Peter. James, this James, is the brother of Jesus. And he is like at a, a high level of leadership in the church. In fact, earlier in Acts, Peter almost refers to James, like, what does James think? Or go report to James on this issue. And, and then James would write the book of James, which is a great general letter to Christians everywhere for all times, right? So anyways, they're going to go take this up with them. But along the way, because this was a long journey from Antioch to Jerusalem, about 250 miles, takes some time. 
They stop at different places along the way and they share the story. And I love that Luke puts in their conversion of Gentiles. In other words, the story of these people becoming members of the family of God, becoming one of us. Not some extra, not some side group, not some, you know, group over here that we just kind of ministered to. No, they are one of us. They've converted. They have become a member of the family of God under the grace of Jesus Christ. And people were rejoicing along the way as they shared their stories. Verse 4, When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they, all de- and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them in order to keep the law of Moses. So again, here we go, the same stuff, right? Just a different group of people in a different place, but the same basic idea. If they're going to belong, they have to do this. And again, so many churches for so many years and so many places at so many times have operated under the basic philosophy, though they would never say this publicly, they have operated under the basic philosophy that you have to learn how to behave before you can belong. And that's a shame. That's a shame. Church is a family. It's a sanctuary. It's a refuge. You can come. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your background. You can come and you can be a part and you can belong. And maybe some point along the way as you are learning how to be, you know, belong and you are feeling comfortable with the family that you learn how to behave. Or not behave, excuse me, but believe. And after you believe, the, the, the Holy Spirit leads you in how you behave and how you live your life like Jesus as He's the one who works in you and through you to make you more like Jesus. We're not the the moral behavior police. Our goal is to proclaim the grace of Jesus Christ. That is the banner in which we are going to rally as a family of believers. So anyways, verse 6. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate... I would love to have been in that room (laughs) and heard some of this stuff. But after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Again, he's referencing back to the Cornelius story in Acts chapter 10. And we think that was probably close to 10 years or so before this council meeting in Acts chapter 15. Verse 8, And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as He did to us. And He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. What a powerful statement by Peter. He, he's like, you know the story. It was 10 years ago even. I went and I was with the Gentiles and God is the one who did these things. Not me, not some other person, not us. This was God. God poured out His Holy Spirit on those Gentiles. So who are we to say that they can't have the Holy Spirit? Who are we to say that they can't belong to the family of God because God is not making a distinction any longer? The only distinction God is making is, do you believe in Jesus Christ whom He sent forth for the forgiveness of our sins? Do you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that He was born, lived a sinless life, became our sins, died on the cross in our place, was buried, rose from the grave? He's alive and He ascended to heaven so He could send the Holy Spirit to live in us and dwell among us and work through us for the glory of God. He's like, God doesn't make any distinction. God's the one who cleansed their hearts by faith. He's the one who gave them the Holy Spirit, His presence, living in them and among them? Who are we to put up these barriers? Who are we to put an extra requirement on them? I mean, most of these people were circumcised at a very young age. They didn't even have the choice to to become a Jew in that regard. 
Who are we to put a stumbling block in front of anybody for receiving the grace of Jesus Christ? It's like, no, it's not through circumcision. It's not through legalism. It's not through acts of self-righteousness. It's through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. Jew, Gentile, Greek, Hebrew, slave, free, man, woman, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's the same avenue to the same God for all the children of God. That's what brings us together, the grace of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, And all the assembly fell silent. How can you argue with that, right? And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. So again, this is the brother of Jesus. They, they heard the good report, the same thing that Paul and Barnabas were sharing on their way, that people were rejoicing about, all these things that God had done to bring people into His family through the grace of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, Simeon, or Simon, or Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophet agree, just as it is written. And again, this, this quote is from the book of Amos. So from their law, the, what the Jews would follow, from their word that they would follow and, and give extra credence to, so to speak. Verse 16, After this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. And the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Ha! Ah, what a wonderful Old Testament prophecy for James to quote in this setting. is basically saying, look, God is going to go about building a new church. He's going to go about bringing forth a new people. And they are not just going to be from the Jews, but they are going to be from all nations of the earth that they would be called by His name, called by His name, and that they would be His people. So this has been a plan for a long time. Before Jesus showed up on the scene, this would be what God would do through Jesus Christ, that He would be the cornerstone on which this new church would be built in all of those things. So, God goes about, or James continues on with his passage, and he says, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogue. So James basically says, look, Let's just ask them to not do things that celebrate idolatry. That's basically what he's trying to say here. It's like we're not going to put any extra burden on them, but they might be coming from a background of idolatry and a pagan worship and those sorts of things. So, you know, this is, we are a new creation. We are new in Christ and we serve one God. That is, that is something we won't compromise on. Circumcision, we can compromise on. One true God, we're not going to compromise on that. So let's send them a letter. Let's, let's send the churches and the Gentiles a letter and let them know that, hey, we are not going to throw these extra burdens and obstacles in your way. It's just the grace of Jesus Christ. But we ask you to abstain from things that are sacrificed to idols and all of that stuff and sexual immorality. And there's a lot of pagan worship tied to that sexual immorality that James is, is referencing. And, and so this council, they draft up this letter and they send it. And Paul and Barnabas, they bring it back to Antioch and they read this letter. And, and there's rejoicing amongst the Gentiles. And, and again, this is a pivotal point in Scripture and in the book of Acts where from here on we hear all about Paul's journeys and his preaching and the trials and the tribulations and the joys and the victories of the gospel of Jesus Christ being shared with all people in all places. And so as we look through this passage and we talk about the subject of unity, 
This seems to be a time in our lives where we are shattered and broken. And I know for us as, as leadership in the church, it seems like throughout this year, as we've tried to make some decision on what we should do and should we do this and shouldn't we do that, it's been this constant tension of, well, whatever we decide, there's going to be a number of people who aren't happy with that decision. Because we are living in this time going through this pandemic together and not just the pandemic this year, but the politics this year and the, the racism and things of that nature and, and the wildfires and, and all of these things where so many of us have really buried ourselves or burrowed ourselves into our opinions and our thoughts on things. And we've allowed those to... to break us apart in some ways and it's really sad and discouraging and I just hope and pray that in the midst of this time that we can remind ourselves of the simplicity of the gospel that Jesus Christ became our sin all of our sin and died on the cross so that we could be forgiven he was buried rose from the grave so that we could have victory over sin and death he went to sit at the right hand of the Father to advocate for us before the Father, to send the Holy Spirit to live in us and, and work through us to make us more like Jesus, to refine us, to give us strength and hope in the middle of these trials and tribulations. And my hope and prayer right now is, as this church in the early part of Acts and the early history, as they came together and decided, you know what? The grace of Jesus Christ is the foundational and most important thing for us. This is the banner in which we're going to rally under. This is our common theme that's going to bring us together. It doesn't matter the background, the line of thinking, the political perspectives, the cultural practices. We are going to be one family under one Lord by one grace through Jesus Christ. So that's what I want us to think about this week is that we come together as one family through the grace of Jesus Christ. May that be true of us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your grace and mercy, Lord, that brings us together as one family. And Lord, in every single family, there are debates, there are squabbles, there are differences, but it's still a family. And I just pray, Lord, this year in this hour with all this stuff going, that you would keep your family together. Even though we meet in different buildings with different styles of worship, different thoughts on, on certain scriptures, Lord, and it seems like we're not very unified. Lord, I, I just know that there's a lot of people uh, that believe in you, who want to see other people know you and have hope in you. So, Father, I just pray that we can all rally together under that one banner of grace, that we are one family by the grace of Jesus Christ. Father, make that more true in our lives now than we've ever known in the middle of all this struggle and turmoil in life. Father, we need your grace for ourselves and we need your grace with each other because we're family. We're your family, Lord. So pour your grace out on us in ways we've never experienced, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness to do so. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, now we're going to have our time of communion and I hope that uh, you've had the opportunity. If not, go ahead and pause the video before we get into it to get some form of emblems, whatever those may be, uh, bread, juice, whatever it is that you have available uh, to represent the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So if you, if you haven't had a chance to do that, please pause the video and go do that now. I wanted to take a look at Colossians chapter 2 real quick, um, especially after the issue in chapter 15 of the book of Acts being uh, mainly about circumcision to hear Paul later then talk about that in Colossians chapter 2 is just really powerful and, and this is one of my favorite chapters in, in the New Testament. And I'm going to start in, in verse 11 and it says, In him you also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through, the, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. So again, you weren't marked to be a part of the family of God by legalism or works of the flesh or self-righteousness, but you were marked as a member of the family of God by the working of Christ through the faith 
in the powerful working of Christ uh, when he was raised from the dead. And we participate in that through baptism. In verse 13, he goes on, he says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Before Christ came along, we were dead in our sins. We were dead in our own fleshly ways, the ways of this world. But he came and he became our sin and he died on the cross and he did away with the punishment of our sin and the record of debt that stood against us. And he nailed it to the cross and he buried it in the grave and he walked right out of that thing, declaring victory for all eternity for those who believe. And he disarmed the rulers and authorities and he triumphed over them. I love this passage. And that is what we celebrate together when we participate in this memorial service of communion. We look back at what Christ has done for us, that it has nothing to do with what we can accomplish. We can't do anything to earn our salvation or righteousness. Not circumcision, the works of the hand, but the circumcision of the Holy Spirit in the heart. And that is made available through the grace of Jesus, through His death, burial, and resurrection, through His crucifixion. And that's what we remember together. The broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ, giving us victory and freedom over our sin. So take a few moments if you need, prepare your heart, and when you're ready, go ahead and eat the bread and drink the juice. Let me pray. Father, again, we thank you so much for your grace. I feel like I'm on repeat when I say that over and over and over again. Every week, every day, thank you for your grace. But Lord, I need your grace hour by hour, every single day of the week. And again, I just ask that you'd pour it out in our lives, Lord. Like we look back on the, the life of Jesus and what he did for people and with people and what he's done for all of us, the fact that he would become our sin. Lord, I, I've said that a hundred thousand times, I swear, and I, I've read a bunch for years about that, and I've studied the books, and I've heard the sermons, and yet I still can't comprehend that truth that Jesus became all of our sin on the cross and that his death satisfied satisfied the punishment due for sin father that's amazing and more than that and why it even works is that christ rose from the grave so father thank you so much for sending your son to do for us what we could not do for ourselves our debt is paid and we are made white as snow. Father, thank you so much for that. We celebrate that together with gratitude in our hearts every time we participate in communion. And Father, we just ask that even though we are not worthy, you would make us to be more like Jesus today. It's in his name we pray. Amen.